Bill Kendi. I'm with uh, the Internet Society. And this panel, uh, Internet Ecosystem Evolution, is, uh, was meant to be the third of a group of panels um, about uh, exploring how to build up an inter Internet ecosystem and industry creating uh, content and applications. Uh, the other panels were um, number 49, IXPs, Building, Sustaining, and Governing Them, which will take place this afternoon at 4.30 in Room 1. Uh, and that's organized also by ISOC. Um, and two members of that panel are here, and we'll talk a little about that. And then um, number f uh, 215, Encouraging Locally Relevant Content to Grow the Internet, which was organized by Disney, and um, a few of those panelists are here and can talk a little about that one as well. This one is meant to build on those two to talk about how to, how to create and foster a broader ecosystem, uh, which would be an industry that's creating content and applications and games to use the Internet and, and leverage all the assets. And the way that we thought about it is that... Um, the IXPs, the Internet Exchange Points, are used to localize traffic exchange and make it more efficient. Uh, locally relevant content in the local language uh, is, of course, going to drive usage because it's most useful to people um, talking about their lives and their culture. Um, but then to, to really drive the content and applications to, to, to drive the usage, you can think about a broader ecosystem, and you could define that in, in many ways, but that would be one that um, has the um, venture capital and incubators to develop companies um, on the supply side and good technical training to, to get people to be able to create those applications. And on the demand side, computer literacy, um, payment systems, and uh, Internet access so people can get online can buy or uh, get access to these new content and applications. So the way that we'll do it is we'll have a brief uh, introduction from each panelist talking about the various pieces, and then we'll open it up for a general discussion among the roundtable and take questions from the floor. And first, to, to start the discussion on IXPs, we have um, Jane Coffin, uh, from ISOC to talk, who's, who's organizing the panel this afternoon on IXPs, and Mike Jensen, a uh, consultant who's done quite a bit of work about IXPs. So, Jane, do you want to start? Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. We certainly appreciate the um, early morning participation. Um, and... Um, I think we'll have questions after, yeah, Mike, after the panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. As Mike said, um, the Internet Society does work on something called Internet Exchange Points, IXPs. It gets a little confusing because people often say ISPs, Internet Service Providers. ISPs will often connect and peer at an IXP um, in order to exchange traffic locally. We often say keeping local traffic local is one of the key things. It builds up local um, brings down latency, which is something that um, creates delays in the network, so you want better quality of service. Helps with local content development because people see that there's a value in that quality of service. They can use that infrastructure more. They have a reliable infrastructure. So we're promoting the development of Internet exchange points from both what we consider to be the human, the technical, and the governance infrastructures. Over the last 20 years, we've seen that formula as the key formula for development of infrastructure, the people, the technology, and the bottom-up technical governance and human governance of that infrastructure. So we're devoted around the world to working with local environments to bring in these Internet exchange points. And again, it's a neutral meeting place where the networks come together to exchange traffic with each other. It is not easy to get people to come together that compete with each other. The, the hardest part we often say about bringing the IXP to a country is the social engineering, which is 80% of the work. Putting an internet exchange point together is not difficult. It's a switch, there's some cross connects, it's a lot more complicated than I'm describing, but we could set one up here in a couple hours if we had the right equipment and the right infrastructure. But the harder part is bringing those uh, entities together to build out the local internet infrastructure and that ecosystem of 
internet pieces. So the IXP is not the one and only part that you need in order to build that technical infrastructure. It is a part of it. It's a critical, important part. Again, it helps with local, uh, local connectivity, better local connectivity, better quality of service, faster uploads. We've seen mobile operators who connected to an IXP in the Democratic Republic of Congo have quality of service shoot up, volume of traffic shoot up in four hours after interconnecting at the IXP. There have been cost savings around the world in different um, countries, and we've been able to prove this causal nexus between economic development and the IXP infrastructure development. We have a report out from last year, uh, May 2012, for Nigeria and Kenya, and we worked with those IXPs to look at the traffic statistics, the interconnection there among different players, and the value chain of benefits from interconnecting and exchanging traffic. Um, Mike, my colleague, and I are working on a report, and he's going to describe that report in a minute and some of the metrics we're looking at for really um, focusing in on best practices, so this is an easier to understand infrastructure. But again, we want to create an environment where local people see the importance and of using that infrastructure because of the reliability of the speed, the quality, and the local content. Again, local traffic, local means you're not sending your traffic out to a third country to exchange it. If you don't have an exchange point in your country, one ISP is taking their traffic out to another country bringing it back in to talk to the other ISP. It's very complicated if you don't have an IXP. So we'll have a session this afternoon, as Mike had said, and we'll dive deeper into how to create them, sustain them, and manage them. The most successful models we've seen are the bottom-up community of interest, the internet community coming together to sustain it because you really need the buy-in from the local community. Um, the other is, uh, key issue, as I mentioned before, is the human, the technical, and the governance infrastructures, those pieces. Part of the Internet ecosystem that is often overlooked because we are at a meeting like this and everyone's talking about different issues, one thing I want to hone in on is that the human trust networks that are built when technical people get together and they see the benefit of that technology and how it works. Again, it's seeing people together in the same room who are trying to build that Internet infrastructure. We recently held a meeting in Morocco, in Casablanca, for it was African Peering and Interconnection Forum. Um, there are four like this around the world. Uh, Raj, my colleague, at the end, um, we helped host Africot, which is another big meeting. He can maybe mention that a little bit where people come together in the region to exchange ideas, technical understanding, and learn more. Those are key for us. But at the African meeting, we had over 30 uh, Internet Exchange Point managers, operators, and network content developers as well, meeting each other because if you're going to exchange traffic with each other, it's better to see each other, to know who that person is and have a little bit more trust and faith in them. That's that human network of trust. It can't be underestimated. It's been part of the core backbone of what we've seen on the Internet in, um, infrastructure development around the world in the last 20 years. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mike now to talk more about, from a granular perspective, some of the work we are doing on this report we're developing on best practices. But know that we work with lo local communities around the world to build up IXPs, but it's where people want us to be. As an Internet society, we don't try and impose ourselves on a community. They know we're a trusted, neutral resource with technical expertise, policy expertise, and local, um, local people on the ground speaking local languages. So there's a great opportunity if you're um, interested in building out local infrastructure to talk to some of our colleagues and experts where we do come in. We also have programs where we bring in donated equipment so that the cost of the startup is lower. We're very, very, very keen to make sure that when we go into a local environment, that we help look at the sustainability of that infrastructure we're bringing in. We don't recommend really high-cost solutions. There are very low-cost solutions to help you get started up, but we're cognizant of the fact that there is also that economic benefit of you sustaining that infrastructure so that we're not just giving you something that you can't sustain later on. So we're very keen to work with that local environment, understand what um, the environment's like, and help create more Internet infrastructure. Uh, thanks, Jane. Um, uh, yes, as Jane indicated, we are in the process of developing an IXP toolkit, which uh, has um, two functions, I guess, really, is, is to help um, 
countries where there are no IXPs, which are about half the countries in, th in the world still, um, get their first IXP going. And then, of course, um, many of the existing IXPs uh, are not operating efficiently yet uh, or at the maximum of their potential to interconnect the local traffic. So the idea there is to help those ones um, get to the next level, as it were, and increase the, uh, the membership and the amount of traffic that they could exchange. And then, of course, um, we shouldn't think of this as a, as a single IXP uh, in each country. Um, many countries actually require m uh, many more than one IX. Uh, Brazil has around 20 now, I gather, and uh, of course uh, the larger countries will have many more, but even some of the smaller countries will need ones in the secondary cities. And as the amount of, of um, data that is exchanged locally increases, especially in developing countries where this isn't the case right now but will be in the future, um, the net number of IXPs will have to go down to the tertiary level cities and even further, depending a bit on the, on the type of infrastructure available. So we've been working quite a bit to um, try and develop a, a, a objective benchmarking uh, process to look at the existing IXPs and to see what, how efficient they are. So we're trying to, uh, for example, look at the number of AS numbers that are announced, the number of prefix that are present there at the exchange, the amount of traffic that uh, takes place at the exchange, and then some of the more sort of operational features such as uh, the um, type of institution hosting the IX, um, even the physical aspects of the IX in terms of, of gaining access to it. Uh, so many of those features to actually um, look at the existing IXs, but then also to embed that in the uh, environment that uh, the IX is operating in, uh, in terms of the uh, telecommunications and internet sector. You know, for example, an if there's a monopoly internet service provider, as there are in some countries still, uh, there's actually not much use for an exchange or uh, very little use for the exchange. It, it can't really upgrade itself. So we need to look at some of those factors, particularly around the dominance of incumbents, which often um, creates a big barrier to, to effective exchanges because they uh, may not appear at the exchange if it exists, or they may uh, limit the uh, interest of other parties in actually getting an exchange going in many cases. Um, and then, of course, the, the national uh, interconnectivity environment is critical. If there's only a, a single operator of fiber optic networks in the country, uh, then there is going to be more difficulty in, in rationalizing the need for an exchange because there's only one source of data, for example. Um, and then at the local loop level, if there isn't a diversity of Internet service providers, then, of course, there's going to be less traffic exchanged. Um, so there are many of those sorts of direct ecosystem factors that need to be addressed as well to ensure that an exchange can be as effective as possible. And, of course, there are a number of indirect factors as well, such as the availability or reliability of electrical power, uh, import duties or um, uh, taxes on um, telecommunications and uh, internet services also creates a barrier. Um, and then there's a general policy environment around things like uh, um, in requiring infrastructure sharing amongst uh, network operators or um, providing uh, access to essential facilities by incumbent operators, for example. So there's a, a general policy environment that uh, we're looking at to, to embed all of this um, benchmarking um, process uh, to really understand what the environment is in the countries and uh, uh, what the factors are that need to be addressed to ensure that these exchanges are operating maximally. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Our next two speakers will uh, kick off the discussion about relevant, uh, uh, locally relevant content and the importance in developing the Internet ecosystem in countries. Uh, the first will be Dorothy Atwood, Senior Vice uh, President of Global Public Policy for Walt Disney, and Janis Karklins, the Assistant Director General of Communi Communications and Information at UNESCO. Dorothy will summarize briefly the panel from yesterday on the topic, and then both can provide their perspective on, on the local content issues. Great. Thank, uh, thanks very much, and I um, 
I really welcome the opportunity to give a, a brief um, summary of what we talked about yesterday. I think uh, there was um, several of us were on the panel yesterday, so I won't completely redo what we had said, but uh, we basically, I think there are three observations that were useful for this conversation today. Um, overall, there was a general recognition of the importance of the pillar of locally relevant content to the um, health and uh, advancement and um, fostering of um, the internet economy. So it's a, it's almost taken for granted that people need to, to actually be interested in going online even when um, there's infrastructure in place. The content drives that interest and, and in developing countries in particular, the content that is of um, uh, new uh, importance is locally relevant content. So one of the observations that the panelists discussed yesterday was that um, what did we mean by locally relevant content? Because there were multiple kinds of content and we, we fleshed that out a little bit. We identified that there is user generated content, that um, there is uh, content that relates to the local community, um, that's kind of news and information. Uh, there's content that relates to the um, cultural preservation of stories and, um, uh, and uh, um, culture. Uh, that was exemplified by one of our panelists talking about um, the uh, preservation of, or digitization and preservation of uh, 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 Balinese culture on, um, and it's not banana leaves, that was uh, palm leaves. I don't know, I've got banana leaves in my, <laughs> I know, you knew I'd say it too because I had it in my head. <laughs> Clearly I've had good food here too. Um, but uh, uh, and as exemplified by that, um, there's the, the element of um, local content that is um, museum and institutional and educational in that regard. Um, and then there's a wide variety of what I would describe as uh, professional content that is a burgeoning uh, uh, locally relevant um, uh, entertainment infrastructure in developing countries and then there uh, obviously are companies uh, such as mine, Disney, that um, are uh, involved with development of professional content that is appealing because it's in uh, local language, etc. for um, uh, developing regions. So we, we talked a bit about the desire to flesh out the kinds of content that are um, of interest, but the, the the um, overwhelming sense I took away from the panel was that all of those uh, uh, types of content were uh, important to fostering the, um, the interest in uh, the internet as, an, as a medium for communication. Um, the second observation was that you had this wide variety of locally relevant content, but the key criteria really for success was quality content. And the quality element was, was ties directly into what you're talking about in terms of the infrastructure. That is, you need to have the ability to have not latent, you know, no latency. You, um, you needed a bandwidth capabilities. You needed all the, the um, kind of infrastructure that will be probably more discussed this afternoon as well, um, but that clearly an emphasis on quality made a huge difference in the in the um, the use and entertainment um, and enjoyment um, of the the content. So that was a, an, an important element that came out. And the final uh, piece I think we discussed a bit um, was the need for economic support for locally relevant content. So you had a lot of content, you wanted quality content, but you also needed to have um, uh, some uh, economic viability and that that presented challenges in small communities with um, uh, uh, unique and individualized languages. Uh, but there was some discussion about the interest that global players are now having. There's um, uh, ideas I know we're going to be hearing about the, um, the seed money and the uh, venture capital and the interest that is now um, uh, starting to develop in the private sector. And then there was some discussion about the role of government there. Um, and I, Giannis, you might talk a little bit about what UNESCO um, is doing, obviously, to promote that as well. But there was a discussion about can government help this? Um, because some of these are, some of this kind of content, important, necessary um, in the public interest, but may not be economically viable. Um, and nevertheless is very important. So those were the kind of the, the three major messages I think that emerged from our discussion yesterday and we can talk more about that later. Hi Herman. So thank, thank you Dorothy. Um, indeed, good morning everybody. Um, speaking about um, 
the role of government and interest of UNESCO in um, local content development. Uh, the interest of uh, organization uh, on these issues started already in early 2000 when um, uh, focus was more uh, ensuring that um, uh, more content uh, in different than English language would be put online. So that, w that was initial uh, drive of UNESCO uh, arguing uh, or promoting uh, multilingual uh, content. Uh, then uh, thinking uh, what kind of incentives governments may have in order to invest in local content production, uh, we uh, thought that uh, economics uh, or uh, money uh, talks the best with, uh, with governments. And uh, we started to, uh, to think if uh, there is any uh, economic uh, incentive or, uh, let's say, positive correlation between the volume of local content uh, which is kept on local internet infrastructure and uh, price that local internet users are uh, paying for uh, access uh, to internet locally. Uh, and we commissioned a study. Uh, it was a study was done uh, jointly by OECD, mm -hmm. ISOC, and UNESCO. And uh, we uh, analyzed uh, the Data. First of all, we, we uh, realized that there is not so much data uh, we could rely on in uh, trying to make this analysis. Uh, nevertheless, we uh, made some assumptions and used data uh, which indirectly in, may indicate the uh, volume of local content. Uh, and uh, what, what conclusions we arrived to was that uh, the uh, internet infrastructure development uh, and uh, local content development, they, are, uh, they go hand in hand and uh, better infrastructure leads to a, a bigger volume of uh, local content uh, on it. We did not though prove uh, the direct link between the access price and volume of uh, local content simply because we did not have sufficient or appropriate data uh, for that. Nevertheless, um, the middle piece which I mentioned, local content, local internet infrastructure, and access price is very important. I, I recall uh, talking to uh, one minister of communications of one of the uh, northern African countries and uh, telling him about this uh, study we did and, and then conclusions we arrived to. And he said, no, no, actually that does not work. I said, why? why? Because um, uh, in that country, local traffic represents 5% of all traffic. 95 is uh, uh, international traffic. And uh, what, is, uh, what was the reason? The reason was that all local content was kept on servers outside. And uh, so th th there is a very, really strong correlation between um, these local activities and, uh, in content production and uh, development of local uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, I would also argue in favor of local in internet infrastructure because apart from um, uh, having uh, physical machines, it also uh, helps to create local knowledge base about Internet, which is uh, equally important uh, to run successfully uh, Internet operations in an, any given uh, country and uh, understand how to improve them and, and address challenges. If you uh, purely rely on um, expertise from outside, that is maybe easy in the short run, but not sustainable in the long run. And, um, and finally, I would like maybe be slightly provocative. And uh, you know that now there are a lot of talks about uh, uh, cloud computing and uh, where, where these clouds should be and, and whether they should all be in the north uh, where uh, natural, I mean, outside temperature helps cooling machines or they should be uh, based in, in every country. And so on. And what um, what I um, hear all the time that keeping information 
on the cloud is cheaper than keeping information on CPU. But what I don't hear uh, in this debate that uh, moving those bits of information from the cloud to machine and back, and most probably several times, costs something. And how much that costs adds to the, uh, this calculation uh, the cheapest and most efficient way. So that, that is the question. And most probably it would be interesting to look at how much moving bits of information from the cloud to machine and back adds to the uh, cost of cloud computing and uh, present uh, the full picture. Argument is it is already paid by access because this is the sort of bulk uh, which uh, each internet user is uh, paying. Fine, I agree. Nevertheless, if you look from the uh, point of view of rationality, then uh, moving uh, unnecessary bits that clogs traffic. And uh, so we need also a factor in, in my view, that, that uh, argument in, into discussion. So I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to answer questions or, or engage in debate. Great, thank you. Now that we've uh, explored the importance of locally relevant content, um, the next two speakers will kick off the discussion of how to jumpstart an industry that's creating it, not just the content, but the applications and making it locally available, and hopefully not on servers that are and, and hosted abroad, but within the country so that it can be accessed quickly and cheaply. So the two speakers that will start speaking about that will be uh, Raj Singh, um, uh, the Bureau Director for Asia for the Internet Society, and then uh, Edward Kamdani, who is the co-founder and managing partner of a, uh, a company called Idiosource in, in Jakarta, which is a venture capital and incubator working on developing uh, consumer applications, online consumer applications. Uh, first, Raj. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'll make these comments uh, from the perspective of other pursuits I have apart from my sock and particularly what I used to do before um, and which was doing startups and trying to make money and not lose money um, so you know I've done startups in several countries um, and in various sectors as well not just technology but agriculture as well as uh, real estate um, but let me talk about the technology piece here. We're doing a technology startup. One of the biggest issues we've come across, or I've come across, is that, you know, in two, maybe three countries in this region, uh, which is where most of my work is, the issue is with, you know, capacity. Uh, and the capacity in particular, you know, so uh, I think uh, Mike and uh, Jane alluded to the fact that you need technical skills to build and maintain and operate the networks and also you've got your infrastructure in place but you need someone to run those things as well and they need to keep abreast with the latest development what's happening you know be it security issues or, or whatever else that may be of IPv6 transition as an example um, so it's, it's very important to be up to date and of course they are in the Asia Pacific region in particular we've got a great um, series or, or a great event called Apricot which brings together more or less about a thousand people every year uh, from the region and from outside the region to discuss these very issues. And the, and the great thing about that foray, you know, talking about the network of trust and all that, is that they all are largely from competing interests. They are from rival companies, but they sit together because they know they need to find a solution to the technical issues or develop best practices around those technical issues. So that's fine. I mean, that, that, that's work in progress. That's happening. What I wanted to actually refer to is the other part of it. So let's assume we have the infrastructure. We have some great content floating around. How do you then start, um, how, how does then the business sector start capitalizing on that? And I think Edward will perhaps talk a bit more about on the funding aspects and, and, and incubation. So I won't touch on those. But what I will touch about is, you know, when um, two startups ago, when I started doing that one, uh, we had a big challenge on our hands because these particular skill sets we needed to do their startup, which was to work for some companies in the U.S. but us from Asia, was that there was a skill gap between what the universities and colleges were producing and what we actually needed. So a, a gap between what industry needs and what uh, the academic institutions produce. And for that became a very serious matter. In the end, we just gave up, to be honest, and we started our own training programs. We also did something else uh, slightly different, which was we stopped recruiting from universities. 
we went to the high schools and said, any one of you want to come and have a go at building uh, you know, some interesting skills and joining a startup? We had quite a few hands go up. Um, I think out of the first team of 40 that we recruited, mixed of, of, of university graduates uh, or, or others, I believe 12, I think, were just out of high school. So they had not gone into a tertiary institution yet. They just finished high school. They're looking at you know, trying to figure out what to do next. What we found out was that when we took them on, trained them, obviously they had some IT skills, interest in, in computing and all that. We trained them according to what we needed done. Um, and I'm happy to say one of those guys has today become a CTO of a company. He still doesn't have a degree. He's never gone through any formal education. Um, and this stuff is picked up. So you know, that, 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 that's a great story, but the story doesn't repeat all the time. You know, it's, 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 it's an extraordinary event, maybe. So w one is that skill gap that we see between what ec economic institutions produce, what industry needs, and where industry is headed. Um, the other part of it, of course, is now assuming we have all that done, we've got all these great guys developing software and apps and, and you know, supporting systems and all that, but they need a market to sell to. The market itself must also have a level of literacy to be able to use and consume this content. Some people refer to it as computer literacy, digital literacy, whatever you want to call it. The point I'd like to make there, I was in Nepal um, earlier this month uh, co-moderating a jury on digital content. And what became very clear there was that you, know, you actually don't need pen and paper literacy to consume this content. Right? Um, the traditional definition perhaps of literacy is that you need to know how to read and write. But in the internet age, and particularly with multimedia uh, and audiovisual, um, uh, you know, things that are available today, perhaps that approach is a bit wrong. You know, digital literacy or computer literacy doesn't really mean you need to know how to read and write. I mean, you need to know how to navigate a computer, press and click, start up content, and so on. Of course, you need to type in a URL, but, you know, let's not worry about that one. Um, so that's one. And very quickly, two other things I wanted to mention in terms of, you know, part of this whole ecosystem. So assuming then we've got the capacity and the skill sets, uh, the other problem we have is, uh, you know, I'm also part of a mentoring network where you know, we try and help young startups do what they need to do and see where they get. Um, and often they complain, they said, you know, I've got this great idea, I know it, I'm going to do great with it, but no one else believes that. And I think in Asia, in so, at least in some parts of Asia, there's this issue about the risk appetite. Uh, people, you know, the traditional entrepreneurs have come from traditional industries. You know, you have a farm, you grow stuff, you sell stuff, you make money. You have a factory, you make stuff, you produce stuff, you make money. But technology is a bit more volatile than that, you know, particularly in the startup, um, uh, tech, tech startups, because there's no guarantee that startup will succeed. And sometimes the weirdest ones succeed and the great ones don't. So that risk appetite factor, particularly in Asia Pacific, I think is a concern as well. And I think we need to try and develop that, that, that mindset within the entrepreneurial com community, the traditional entrepreneurial community, community that, you know, have a go. Yes, 99 will fail, but maybe you'll have that one that does really well, you know. So, so perhaps just a change in, in culture and mindset. And the last one I wanted to talk about was, assuming all that is in place, you've got some great guys building apps and software and whatnot, there's also the issue about how will people pay for that content, assuming it's chargeable content. Um, most people in this region, or a large part of them, don't have credit cards or debit cards. You know, a lot of them are from the unbanked sector. They don't even have bank accounts. Um, but they still want to consume content. They go for the free content, obviously, because it's free. But you know, what's the payment model? And particularly when you're looking at micropayments. So it's not even large sums of money. They're the small amounts of money. Um, even that is not manageable because sometimes to send ten dollars costs you twenty, so that's also an issue. I think you know as part of a larger ecosystem uh, discussion. I'll leave it there because I think uh, Edward may have some great insights uh, on that. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Michael, and I think a very good point from Raj as well. Um, I'm, my name is Edward, right, uh, and from Idea Source, and uh, I'm running a. a incubator and venture capital base in Jakarta, but we are investing also in, uh, in the region as well, uh, in Singapore. Um, the, the problem with the uh, investment in, 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 in startups uh, technology, you know, consumer internet, internet in Indonesia is that uh, unlike in the Silicon Valley where, you know, we can invest, uh, there are plenty of uh, investment for 
uh, startups that has uh, no track record, you know, no history uh, in Indonesia and also in the region. Uh, we, as a venture capital, we we need to take a look at the uh, possibility to have a sustainable, uh, you know, portfolio companies. Uh, why? Because we know, like Raj says, you know, uh, we cannot afford to invest uh, 90 companies or uh, nine companies and then one, uh, you know, florist because the ecosystem is not there. <clears throat> Unlike in the U.S., you have a uh, possibility to have uh, multipliers uh, for the investment by a lot. But in Indonesia, usually uh, the multipliers will not, you know, be more than 10 times, you know. Um, so what uh, Michael, you know, asked me to do, you know, uh, for this uh, forum is that to cover a bit about what kinds of companies are being funded by us and then what challenges uh, do we face and then policies and infrastructure that help the portfolio companies. So um, the type of the companies that occupies first, I want to analyze on the uh, Internet exchange that, you know, outside the IXP, uh, which is a local, uh, like probably Mike mentioned, in Brazil there are plenty of uh, uh, local uh, exchanges. Uh, in Indonesia, there are actually uh, two. You know, one is driven by uh, associations called ABG, and then uh, the second one is uh, neutral, is called IDC. And there are plenty of uh, ISPs reside in IDC because of price, basically. Um, and if we take a look, you know, I think 50 to 60 percent of the occupancies in uh, IDC is uh, ISPs. And uh, the data is there, so we can actually capture who they are. Uh, as far as the... Uh, you know, uh, within the ISPs, what type of uh, contents, you know, uh, reside there. Uh, I collected data of the trend in a consumer uh, internet based on the Tech in Asia. Uh, if you go to uh, techinasia.com, 49% uh, for the last six months, you know, Q2 and Q3 2013, 49% uh, occupied by e-commerce players, and then 19% online games, 19% uh, online media, uh, payment 4%, uh, advertising network around 3%, and mobile messaging and the rest around 2%. So I think if we want to focus on you know. Uh, uh, local contents, you know, those are the, the bigger ones. And why we don't see any on the social media is basically we know that Indonesia has around uh, more than 50 million Facebook users. So basically, well, on the social media, there is no chance for uh, incubators and venture capital to develop a local uh, social media platform anymore because, you know, Facebook has... Uh, dominated already. Twitter is also in millions in Indonesia, very popular. Path is also coming up in uh, Indonesia. So we see the trend of Facebook users used to be an AB segment right now uh, uh, coming down to C and D while the path is coming up, you know, uh, because it's limited to 150. A lot of the maven and also the uh, uh, leaders uh, that knows the technologies a lot they go to path right now um, so I think uh, if you you know go deeper uh, for example on the e-commerce side you know we have uh, travel is very popular in Indonesia uh, multi-product e-commerce sites very popular as well uh, travel I think is around uh, 18 percent 18 or yeah 18 percent uh, Multi-product e-commerce around 17%, B2B marketplace 13%. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, travel 18%, apparel, accessories, e-commerce, very popular. You know where where they sell fashions uh, and and cosmetics. Uh, there's 70%. Marketplace. Uh, we have popular marketplaces in Indonesia like Tokopedia, Tokobagus. Uh, you know those uh, startups. Um, and discount like uh, Groupon, you know, 
uh, we call this two in Indonesia. Yeah. So uh, I think back to the those are the type of companies uh, ha uh, that are being funded and also uh, we have plenty in Indonesia. Challenges we do face right now, uh, especially in Indonesia, um, we don't have any uh, government support. That's uh, what we face right now. So some of our portfolio we actually uh, incorporated in Singapore. Why? Because uh, the tax treaty is much better. Uh, the investment, uh, you know, environment is uh, ecosystem is there. Um, easier to set up a company in Indonesia. We need around two months to uh, set up a company in Singapore. We just uh, one day. Um, and then also the government support in 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 Singapore. We have uh, government support in a way of a VC investing one dollar and a government invested uh, six dollars. You know, it's a very good uh, uh, attraction for investors to have this kind of uh, scheme, you know. And then the uh, quality of Internet uh, connectivity is also a factor, you know. Um, that's the reason also in Indonesia more than 50 percent, uh, close to 60 percent of payment, online payment is being done offline, meaning that you click the uh, shop cart. And then you have to pay through ATMs or to uh, online banking system. Uh, unlike in the U.S., you know, you have PayPal. You, a credit card is common. You know, Indonesia uh, credit card users is not that many actually. So we we face those kind of an issue in Indonesia right now with payment as well as logistics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks, everyone, for, for running through that. Now it would be good to open up the discussion. And first, if, if any of you have any comments or thoughts on, on what the other panelists uh, were saying, um, that, that would be great just to, to get some reflection. And then I have some questions. And, of course, I uh, would love to, to get questions from, from the audience. Does anyone have any comments or thoughts? Mike? There's a common factor, and we often speak here about multi-stakeholderism and the multi-stakeholder model, and in some cultures, using that word is a little strange, but let's just say many people and many stakeholders who have a role in the environment. Um, government is an important factor, and we were just hearing different pieces about the challenges and the interface that you almost need to have with government. I think we often forget as the Internet community or the startup community or even... Um, if we're at UNESCO and other places, you almost are in a role on occasion of teaching government officials more about the, the ecosystem and the environment. I used to be a government official, so I'm, I'm not being disrespectful, but when I needed to understand more about technology, uh, internet exchange points, uh, internet addressing, I went to the people that knew more than I did, and it's very hard for some government officials to admit that they don't know something. And so you have to interface, and I learned a lot more. <laughs> I see a colleague in the back laughing. <laughs> um, we really do need to figure out a better way as an Internet community to get our message out about the great work we do, the, the work we do together in partnership. This is not something we ever do alone. And you can see at this table, you've got a UN institution, a great colleague who's done more work in the different continents, Michael, who's an economist, um, Dorothy, who knows about the, a lot of different things from regulatory to other, Raj, who's had startups, Edward on startups. We all are partners in different ways with different institutions and others and trying to not forget that how we interface with government officials and teach them, if we can, quietly, without being disrespectful, but also take them out of their element so that they don't feel as though they're with part, their own colleagues and that they're embarrassed. Um, often you find that you have to have one-on-one -on -one sessions and then you can figure out a way to, to be a better partner. But there is a way to try and create a non-antagonistic environment, and I think that's important because if we're ever going to get the policy environment right, the regulatory environment right, some of these things that probably make your head hurt if I talk about submarine cables and the backhaul from the submarine cable landing station, if you don't have a liberalized environment with those submarine cables, which carry almost all the traffic of the world with satellites, the Internet just doesn't run around in the cloud, right? You have The cloud is really submarine cables and other piece parts. You have to have a good environment in order for that submarine cable, uh, the people who, involved in the, who are involved in the consortium, to bring the traffic into the country at lower prices. 
We're talking about bringing the price of connectivity down because when the prices go down, as the UNESCO report said, connectivity goes up because people use it, the traffic goes up, volumes are up, the prices come down. Those are just facts. So if you can bring down that cost of connectivity, which is what we're trying to do with IXPs, which is what we do when we talk to other officials, if you bring the officials into that ecosystem, they're a partner, that can help. I think that's one of the key issues. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, um, I just wanted to uh, reinforce what you said in terms of um, the cost factor. I mean, developing countries, Africa in particular, we're looking at the average broadband connection costing 50% of the average salary. So uh, that's in comparison to 2 or 3% in Europe. Until we get that uh, cost factor down through all of these different ecosystem aspects, we're not really going to see a lot of local content developed. Um, I just had an interesting um, observation about the um, issue about where the cloud sits and, and the cost of moving bits back and forth from, from the cloud in, in a foreign country. And uh, I think the, the cloud should be seen as including the... the, 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 the um, pipes going to the cloud and uh, clearly um, the, the economic imperative is such that people are m moving their applications offshore as it were onto the cloud and I think perhaps though an interesting dynamic though that is now reared its head this year is the uh, Snowden revelations which have now increased awareness and interest actually in bringing those bits back into the country's cloud at any rate and, and not to see the cloud of some large um, diffuse entity somewhere else in the world. And I think that dynamic is going to have an interesting role to play in, in, in the coming short-term future. Okay, uh, any, any questions? Um, for any of the panelists, uh, oh. there no, okay. I'm Pinda Wong, Hong Kong. I'm, I'm very interested in the comment um, from the gentleman from Indonesia. Uh, obviously, you gave a very uh, good set of reasons why certain investment in startups hasn't happened. You made a comment about um, payment, I believe. Um, it seems to me, you know, before the internet, there was another network. It's also global. It also sort of shifts bits around. It's the banking network. So a lot of developed economies don't actually, who are not yet connected into, to the Internet, may not actually also have a banking network. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how are you going to solve that? Because on the other hand, you want to promote Internet. One great killer app of the Internet is getting paid. <laughs> um, if you can't route money, then it's, is it only going to be a social thing? Because you can't develop your e-commerce infrastructure if, if you can't get paid or you can't pay. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, very good question. And also uh, many uh, outside, outsiders uh, you know, from abroad that coming to Indonesia are uh, quite appalled by the... <coughs> By the uh, nature of uh, online, you know, it's we know it's a 250 million population, uh, but uh, unfortunately we have more than 50 percent of unbanked people. It's not just because they don't have the money, but uh, it's more like uh, it's, it's 10 kilometers kilometers away to go to the bank, you know. So uh, it's very difficult for them. So uh, again, uh, connectivity is uh, very important. Accessible to mobile connectivity is very important for the mobile payment. But it's not, uh, there is no one uh, dominating payment system in Indonesia. So it's an opportunity, basically. Um, like I said, uh, more than 50, 60 percent online payment is being done by, uh, you know, mostly a, a, a bank solution. You know, it's a bank-centric payment system. Uh, fortunately, most uh, large banks in Indonesia, they provide uh, plenty of options. You know, they have uh, online uh, internet web-based payment. They have a mobile payment system. Even in mobile payments, some banks, uh, they, they provide a solution based on the UMB uh, and also on the uh, WAP. So uh, there's plenty of option, option for this um, uh, online consumer payment, you know, uh, 
but that's also a problem. There is no common major like in the U.S. that you can use credit card. You know, and credit card is a base. You can connect to PayPal. You can connect directly to many types of payment. is is centralized. So in Indonesia, is what happened is you know is dispersed a lot of uh, uh, I mean a lot of uh, variety of payments, but the volume is big. It's huge. If you take a look in uh, one of the article of Tech in Asia, uh, basically right now you know people from abroad uh, begin to understand uh, the volume of online payment. I mean online uh, transaction is a lot. Is uh, also increasing uh, and. No dominating payment system is 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 uh, you know exists in Indonesia right now. I hope that answers your questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I think the gentleman from the W3C Web Payments Group is here. The WC3 I think tries to develop web standards, so that may be something interesting to follow up. I just wanted to add uh, just on this payment issue. Um, in India, there's a company called Flipkart.com. Uh, which is a fairly dominant player in that landscape. So they have an interesting payment model. Um, it's called cash. And specifically, it's called cash and delivery. So you go online, you do your order of goods and services, whatever else you need. They'll ship it out to you. A guy will knock on your door, hand you your goods, and ask for the money in cash. Problem was, um, I was just talking to one of the guys recently. He said, we've actually stopped stop offering that service in certain parts of India. I asked him why. He said, it's very simple. These buggers order what they want, arrives at the door. They haven't actually seen the product before. They open it up, look at it. They don't like the color. They don't like its look or feel, and they return it. He said, sorry, we don't, you know, because part of the return policy is that they'll take it back within, you know, whatever days it is. Mm -hmm. So now they've started demarketing the country into areas where they will not offer cash on delivery or COD, as they say, uh, and not. So... You know, it, it was just an, uh, a response to your question of what is the, another payment model. There is still the old cash payment model, but, you know, obviously that has some challenges too, depending on what the customer is uh, doing or not doing. And I, I guess I would just add um, that I don't think we should think narrowly just about payment methods, but I think we have to think about um, trusted environments because you can see one of the limitations is the inability of, of banks to believe that they're going to have um, the, the capability of, uh, to avoid fraud and and um, and so you're not seeing Africa has a real huge issue with this res in this respect. You're not seeing some of the multinationals that could actually offer some micropayment alternatives and platforms entering some markets because of the f their perception that there aren't um, there aren't. Uh, um, uh, mechanisms in place to avoid fraud and uh, security issues. And so I think that's a, one of the things we can work on from an infrastructure perspective to add the security element that could, in fact, encourage some other different forms of payment uh, methods beyond the issues of, you know, micropayments and that kind of thing. So. Thank you. And if, if I can just uh, ask a, a follow-up question on that. Um, in, you know, in many developed countries, there's advertising supported models, certainly for content, obviously not for e-commerce. Um, but uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about if those markets are developing or um, if those possibilities exist on the content side for gaming and for other things that are typically or can be advertising supported. Uh, yes, I, I want to add a, a bit about uh, what happened with the lo local content and also content from abroad in Indonesia. If you uh, see that uh, Facebook, um, they have more than 50 million, but um, and also a game, you know, like in iTunes, it's very difficult for Indonesians to actually buy uh, iTunes uh, credits. Um, so what happened is that uh, Indonesian they 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 love uh, free free contents, you know. So uh, I think we, we need to uh, focus at the beginning to uh, see more ad networks to, you know, capture uh, those uh, online uh, users. Uh, so we actually monetize from the other side, you know. We don't charge directly to the uh, consumer, but actually uh, brands or uh, other advertisers would pay for that, you know. Uh, that's one way. And then um, it's uh, also, uh, I want to say something, but I, I forgot, you know. 
uh, but we see uh, one of my portfolio, uh, Touch 10, for example, you know, they develop a lot of uh, good content in, in gaming. And because of the issue of monetization in Indonesia, so they go abroad, you know, so what they, what they do is they, they use publishers like iTunes, uh, Google App Stores, you know, to monetize. And then they collaborate with uh, local uh, publishers in China to publish their game, localized games as well, as well in Korea and in Japan as well. So that's what they do, you know, as a local uh, content provider. But for uh, local content itself, the ecosystem is not there yet in Indonesia. Yeah, so it's difficult for content owners to monetize Indonesia. Um, so what we do right now in Ideal Source is that we actually uh, entice uh, our, our uh, portfolio companies to create a platform whereby their expertise, you know, with connecting with the app networks and everything. So there's a way for these developers uh, embed uh, with our portfolio company's SDK, you know, as a wrapper with all the connectivity to the app networks there. So they, they're, they're able to monetize directly from day one, you know, uh, when they use this wrapper, you know. Okay, thank you. Any other? Uh, Christopher? Um, Christopher, you from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this conversation to me strikes me as very important, but it reminds me very much of a fixed line world in a world where the ecosystem is moving towards wireless. And I'm wondering if you could comment on, you know, in, in the world where LTE isn't deployed, the old wireless world is still, you know, circuit switch, legacy telephone based technologies, and bypasses a lot of this. And I'm wondering if you could expand your remarks, uh, if any of the panels could expand their remarks to understand how, as things become increasingly wireless, and particularly in the hiatus between a full LTE deployment in a lot of the world, uh, how you see the ecosystem evolving. I would make just one comment from a content pr provider's perspective, is that the, it's, it's not just um, moving to a mobile environment, but it's moving to a smartphone environment. So right now you're still limited to the feature phone environment in many of these uh, locations. So that limits the richness of the content that, you know, uh, we could do, whether it's interactive or, um, you know, in a game kind of environment. It also goes to the issue of, of advertising-supported models because the feature phone doesn't have that same it's much more subscription-based, you know, you're, um, at, than it is uh, having the kind of multimedia-rich content. Now, we're moving rapidly toward having those kinds of devices uh, become more, um, uh, you know, more accessible. I think you're also seeing government policy encouraging that. You know, you, you see, um, you see tablets being offered in educational content uh, for educational content in schools uh, by governments. But I, I, I don't think it's as, as simple as mobile versus fixed. I think there is a, a, um, uh, an equipment element to that uh, as well as an infrastructure element. And, um, and until you see that, I know from Disney's perspective, we, we, um, there's a big question, do you build for a feature phone or do you build for a world, even though the, the addressable market right now is quite small, using Indonesia as an example. Um, but I think that is a gator as well. Um, I just wanted to add, so on this issue of LTE and other emerging technologies with wireless, um, so, you know, I, I think there's a policy issue around that too, and in particular, uh, let me go further to say it's actually a tariff issue as well. Um, in the couple of countries I reside in, um, two in particular have both gone to LTE or introduced LTE uh, networks, and the subscription rates are ridiculous. You know, yes, it's fast, right, but why should I pay five times the amount, you know, and when I'm really not going to be consuming all that much more, it'll just get to me quicker, maybe. So I think that that's also an issue, and of course, what perhaps makes that situation worse is because a lot of governments have been auctioning off the spectrum at equally ridiculous rates, and obviously there's a, you know, there's an overhead. That money's got to be recovered somewhere. It has to come from subscription. So I think there's also an issue there that the technology is great, but I think we have some, a few obstacles on the way in terms of regulatory and the tariff environment, maybe. I, I may say um, 
that we see at UNESCO that many ministries of education uh, uh, see the a great potential in um, uh, mobile technology and tablets. Uh, there are now concepts emerging uh, like school in the box, if I may say, where, where, where tablet is at the center, which is the very um, powerful computing uh, piece, uh, but uh, lightweight. You can upload all educational content. You put uh, a solar battery next to it and, and uh, off, off the shelf uh, projector. Uh, put a, uh, a sheet, white sheet uh, between, between branches somewhere, you have a school. Uh, of course, the, this, uh, this is a technological part of it. Then you need to, to have a, a trained teacher. Uh, but never, nevertheless, uh, the tendency is to uh, explore uh, the uh, potential which gives these uh, mobile devices for education. And uh, at UNESCO, we're working with technological companies. Uh, and uh, once a year, we're organizing so-called Mobile Learning Week, where uh, companies are coming and showcasing uh, the, the, their, their products. They're exchanging information. Uh, and they meet um, uh, education professionals. Uh, so that, I think that this, this is the one trend which we can uh, say exists now. Also in response to your question, this may seem like a very granular answer, but um, it goes back to a point that was made, I think Dorothy was making, about equipment. It's one of my big issues these days because we're trying to move some switches and routers out to help build Internet exchange points. The customs duties and the taxes for equipment are killing us. We're a nonprofit. We're sending donated equipment to a country that's new. Also, used is still pretty good, so don't <laughs> take that there. But this is an issue where if you're an innovator or a small business, you too could try and push. It's that push-pull with government and others. If you can't get that, that equipment in and it's held in what I call jail <laughs> at the border, it's really complicating your ability as a country to move, uh, to, to move to that next level. We call it leveling up. But, for example, on the spectrum side, if you're working, you, get the you can't get the equipment in to facilitate the, the business and or the entertainment or something else. So as we're saying, there's that whole ecosystem of different issues, value chain. Michael, before he came to the Internet Society, was at Analysis Mason, helped us with a report at, called Removing Barriers to Connectivity. And Raj and I are thinking of trying to do one here uh, in different parts of Asia, where we take a look at different pieces of the system, whether it's government and their investment policies and attracting investment. Um, is it the policy regulatory? Uh, the tax, other other um, internet exchange points, but different parts of that system that you can help alleviate. And sometimes you just do have to shine a light through a report or others or panels like this where you can pull apart those uh, different factors, which might help. Any other question? Uh, no? Please. Okay, my name is Mei An. I'm um, an ISOC and IGF ambassador from Singapore. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. I realize that the panel spans quite a large range of uh, issues, and I was trying to take notes because I think Michael requested <laughs> for some assistance there. I'd like to make a, a comment on the idea of entrepreneurs. Um, we've covered things like developing local content, uh, payments, um, and supporting of a startup, the startup community. Um, I think that for the, for, from a, my point of view, where I'm seeing it, because I do work in cloud computing um, in Asia, I think that the next development for business and sustainable entrepreneurship will be from the small and medium enterprise units. I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. Um, in Asia especially, 99.99% of all businesses are small and medium enterprises, however you want to define that in terms of revenue or in terms of uh, employees. And we're seeing... Uh, some leapfrogs happening in the world already. So, for example, we were talking about problems with payment. Um, Kenya, 
M-Pesa is a great example that's been used all over the world. Uh, my company has done work in Mongolia, in Indonesia, as well as we've recently con concluded a study in um, Sri Lanka on the unbanked and the underbanked and how they can use not just smartphones. So it, I, I know Dorothy mentioned that it, it, we're moving into a smartphone community, but I think that there is also a place for feature phones because you've got the USSD codes that you can use to transfer money. Now, so you've got these, these um, mobile banking opportunities that have sprung up because of a gap, and that's, that's fantastic. Uh, the, the real issue, and I think, oh, Pin is, Pin is gone. Uh, <laughs> I think that the, the, there are opportunities there that are yet untapped. Um, so that's number one, the payments issue um, is, is uh, uh, readily available, I think. Um, and ready to go. There are regulatory barriers that have been flipped up because I think the people um, most well connected would be the telcos, but telcos don't have a financial license, and that's a regulatory barrier for them to enter. So you've got the you've you've got the infrastructure ready. It can be done. Regulation hasn't caught up quite yet. So that's for payments. For content sharing, um, we're seeing a lot more new services being, avail being made available. Uh, Pandora was the first thing that started with Internet Radio, and now we're seeing Spotify come up with this idea of information, uh, content sharing, so you, you have access to content, you're selling access, they're giving away access to content, but you buy access on, again, the smartphone and the mobile world. Um, and that's on, the base on, on a subscription basis as well. I think Netflix, I, I'm from Singapore, I don't actually have Netflix available to me yet. That's very sad unless I use a VPN. But here we're seeing another um, development. Uh, education and books. I think there is a new startup called Oyster, which again comes up with this idea of uh, content sharing uh, and access to content in a library format rather than buying the book. So there goes your Amazon model of actually buying things. And again, from Singapore, even though we're fairly well connected with payments and with um, infrastructure, we can't actually buy the books because of geographical boundaries that exist in the, um, the, the wired world. I think somebody mentioned we're moving from a w wired world to a wireless world. Uh, so for me, I think that the support of startups is quite essential today. Um, so what you mentioned about the comparison, you know, why you didn't want to set up in Indonesia because there was more support in Singapore, that's very interesting to me. Um, I'm personally not right now working on a 14-country study uh, of SMEs and cloud computing and the government policies that are supporting um, startups and SMEs in these 14 countries. So, and, and that's coming up soon, uh, probably next year. So if you want, I can, I can share that with you. Um, but I think, well, again, the corollary to all of this great positiveness is that we have, I always find it interesting to note that um, reducing barriers to connectivity, increasing globalization, allowing people to move online and access content that's not available in their own country, well, that sort of stemmies the local content development. If I can get a book off Amazon, if I can get something off Amazon, why do I want to buy it? from my local store, or my, if I can read something that's available um, on an international website, why do I want to make sure that I can, why do I, why do I want to read it from a locally hosted um, server, for example, even though it may be the same thing. There, there are some issues there which I haven't quite thought through yet. Um, I don't think that we that we've gotten to the point where we can actually see because I think we're still focusing on infrastructure development um, and just making sure that everybody's connected first. But I see that as an upcoming issue. Thanks. I just want to go back to the payments issue, um, and, and I really do believe. One of our greatest challenges right now, particularly in the startup economy, let me call it the startup economy, is the micropayment issue. And more so, you know, the cut these payment gateways take um, when you buy or sell something, oh, or when you sell something, I should say. Um, be it Apple, which has its own rather high margin 
cut, or be it the third party providers, which also have a pretty significant cut of what you have. Now, if you're selling something for $2, an app, let's say, you know, you, if, if 60 cents out of that goes away to someone else and you're left with a dollar forty, then you've got your overheads to pay with, you know. Yeah, sure, if you have volume, if, if you have a million people who use the app, great. But, you know, there are not that many apps with a million users. You know, you're in the thousands maybe or the tens of thousands at best. So I think going forward in terms of how we can further develop the complete ecosystem, I think the micropayment model I think is going to be quite critical for our future success. I just wanted to sort of emphasize that. Um, yes, it's very true on the payment side of, uh, to leverage the content. Uh, basically, uh, we are in discussion with uh, Japanese venture capitals as well, where, whereby in Japan they have uh, a platform, I forgot the name, but it's probably I, Docomo or something. I mean, the, the, the platform that they have is actually integrating the uh, telco with the banks. So a bank and telco, they work very closely, and the regulation allows that. So what they take from the content uh, owners is only like 7% to maximum 10%. So uh, that's why we see a lot of uh, contents uh, in Japan, and uh, consumers actually buys a lot of it. You know, While in Indonesia, we collaborate with telcos for the payment, which is the easiest one you know, to cut their, uh, uh, the balance from the credits, uh, is 60%, you know. 40 to 60 percent, depending on the content, content providers. So, but we are seeing right now uh, telcos try to move to other type of payment that uh, regulators uh, allows them to charge. You know, for example, in in uh, in, in telecom cell they have uh, TCAS, uh, in in Excel they have Excel 29, in Indosat they have uh, Dompetku. You know, what, but the issue is a lot. Uh, with the adoption is because of the regulation, KYC, know your customers, uh, they find it very difficult to have an adoption. So it's uh, back to the, uh, like like uh, mentioned by, uh, you know, the, it's not a matter of uh, uh, not having the technologies, but, you know, making a platform popular, basically. And I guess I, I just wanted to comment on your, you're trying to figure out the difference between content that is uh, globally sourced and local content and how does that work out and we talked a bit about that in the panel um, yesterday um, because there seems to be some perspective um, that uh, that there is a tension between the um, the support for uh, locally relevant content that may be um, that may be appealing to a niche market and content that may be uh, of a global interest, you know, I'll use a Hollywood movie and I'll, um, versus a a, um, a a local um, uh, a local story. And it, it, you know, my perspective is that there is no tension; that there is, in fact, a desire for both, and that the capacity that's built in order to create compelling content that is an environment that is encouraging of creativity, that is in fact express, if richly expressive, that's not censored, that has appropriate licensing and IPR, or intellectual property protection or anti-piracy measures. Those kinds of things are necessary for both kinds of content and all kinds of content and that in fact what the internet platform does is it enhances the ability to create different communities that may support a business model that in the physical world wouldn't be supported. So you, we were talking at the panelists, we were talking before we started the panel about, um, about the uh, interest that um, in either language or culturally small groups can find content on the internet that they couldn't before, which creates markets, which actually allows a global distribution. If it's a Indonesian um, story that uh, would resonate with Indonesians in, U in the U.S. or in Africa or in the Europe, that's more likely now to see the light of day than had there not been a platform that would allow that because of the diaspora, because of the effect of being able to have um, uh, communities find that kind of content. So, so while there is some Commodification, I don't know if that's a word, Commodi you, uh, um, in my, uh, my economist, I need to have it, uh, making the, uh, well, there is some concern that you create commoditization, thank you, um, 
some concern that you know you'll go to the lowest price point for some I think that when it comes to content, the differentiator is, in fact, the uniqueness of that story and the quality um, of that product. And so I don't, I don't see the tension. I think there, that's a, so, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, question to kind of solve. So. About that local content issue, we're seeing fabulous diaspora-related business coming up where in, say, Nigeria, there's something called Nollywood. They copied Bollywood, which has been in a wildly successful uh, venture in India for movies and other. What Nollywood is doing in a small company, not a small company now, but before called Iroku, which is based in the UK, would be in Nigeria if they had better local network capabilities. They're working with us on some of those issues to talk about infrastructure development. But they're building up the sports, enter sports, entertainment, and music industries in Nigeria. And they're producing local films, which are being sourced all uh, in Nigeria. But the requests for that content are coming from all over Africa and all over the world because you have pockets of the diaspora outside that. And I know the local content industry in parts of Latin America is being built up. Colombia itself wants to become more of a, a movie center or a content generation center. So you're seeing different businesses start up with diaspora pulling in. That may be an interesting subsidization issue where you're getting the diaspora helping keep those businesses, the small businesses and the startups going. And the other thought I just had when we were talking about local banking, the Grameen Bank had this great model with local banking loyalty to that local bank and mobile. So there's a potential opportunity there for that interface, a great business opportunity, quite frankly, with the local banking, the mobile banking, and um, some of what you're doing as well in, in the content generation and the small company buildup. Um, thank you uh, for such a great panel. Uh, my name is Buzian Zaid. I'm a university professor, and I'm here part of the delegation of Freedom House, and I live and work in Morocco. Um, just a couple of comments about the, uh, the idea of local content. In developing countries, non-democratic countries, the issue of local content is quite political in nature. Now, the print media and broadcasting in particular are quite controlled um, by the state. There is a lot of repressive laws that govern the print and, 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 uh, and broadcasting. Online media becomes this, this new sphere, this new public sphere where people can actually say things. And, 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 and not only that, but as we've seen with the Arab Spring, how, how Twitter and Facebook were very instrumental in educating, organizing, mobilizing people. So it, was, it wasn't the reason why the Arab Spring happened, but it helped a lot. But the what you mentioned about traffic happening, most of it happening overseas because most of the, the local content is hosted in, in, for, in, the, in service. It's really for political reasons. I mean, people wish they could host their, their servers at home, but, but they can't because of the, the amount of control the state have the, has over the ISPs, uh, the internet service providers, which, of course, allows them direct um, uh, um, control over, over, over traffic within the country, so that's why they go overseas. So, I mean, um, I like this discussion about the technology and about um, the innovation, the business models, but I think when it comes to developing countries, not democratic countries, I think the power of the Internet in, in really in pushing for democracy and pushing for um, a better life, because it's not all about money and, 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 pro and economic prosperity, it's about the right to to express yourself, the right to have um, your, your voice heard, the right to have an impact in the, in the political progress. And, and we've seen that happening. We're not, uh, not saying, hey, the West have to help us do this, but, but it's important that in discussions about technology that the focus is also on that, on that potential of, of uh, the liberating potential of, of the media, of, uh, of Internet. Thank you. I think that uh, rights existed before. There were, there, there were very limited opportunities of self-expression in, in, in many countries. And, and indeed, 
uh, internet provide that opportunity and liberate and, and, and give, give uh, gives voices to those who were never heard. Uh, uh, humans uh, always have been uh, socially active and, and wanted to communicate. And, and myself, I'm, I'm coming from from Latvia, and um, Latvia 20 years ago uh, uh, went through the, the, the process of social transformation after the collapse of Soviet Union. And um, uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion uh, with the one editor of newspaper uh, in, in Russia. He said, um, in Soviet times, there were thousands of um, letters of readers uh, to the newspaper. Uh, expressing different opinions and, and uh, anger and, and joy and so on. Uh, and that was editor-in-chief who picked two, uh, one, two, three and published it on ev every day in the newspaper. He so, said, so today, nobody writes any more any letters to, uh, to the newspaper, but everybody has its own blog. And so that is the difference. Uh, the point is uh, people, uh, people always have been socially active. Only Internet provides really a very good platform for, for uh, uh, self-expression. And uh, uh, so that, that is indeed a very big advantage. And thank you for raising that, that, that issue. I think we have time for one more question. If not, I'll, I'll just maybe ask a final question and, and people can, can comment on it. Um, so Giannis talked about the uh, first uh, OECD ISOC UNESCO report and that there's a correlation between access and con local content. And, uh, you know, I understand it's very hard to, with the numbers, there's not enough data available to really, um, you know, say definitively what drives what, but I just wondered if people had thoughts about whether the more local content will drive, will get more people online because there's clearly people who, you know, there's many people who could have access to the internet that aren't for, for various reasons, um, or the other way around, will um, the, the more users come online, will it naturally bring out uh, the opportunities for, for more content, or is it really a, a kind of a mixed thing? So kind of which way is what what's driving at the content or the users? So, you know, I, I think it's, it's an interesting, interesting question. I don't think there's one straight answer to that. Uh, but I think what is required is a critical mass of users to be able to support local content. What that critical mass is, I think, depends on the market itself. Um, for a large market or a large language base, let's say, um, you know, 10% of that language base could be a sufficient enough market. But for a very small language base, you know, it may require 50 or 80% of that population to be online and fully connected to be able to then support a local uh, content ecosystem. Um, yeah, so you know, I think it's, it's get, reaching that critical mass. I think in many instances we are nearly at that critical mass in most countries. And even in the countries we are not at the critical mass, people want to be part of the critical mass. You know, there's a desire to be connected and to be online and to do things. Now, the, the content piece itself, I mean, you've got what I would call popular content, which may not necessarily be local. Uh, you know, it may be Bollywood, Hollywood, Nollywood, or Disney. I'm waiting not for... All of us. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and I'm waiting for boats and trains. You've got cars and planes. So, um, you know, but... Uh, I think, they, I think it was you, Anis, who said that you know, when you buy a newspaper in, in the panel yesterday, the first couple of pages are all about local news. You get to the global or international news on the fifth or sixth page. And I think that's very true. Once people are online, once they're accessing this offshore content, they will come a time and will say, okay, but what's happening locally? Let me also see what's happening here. And therefore, they will also start using the local content. So. I, I guess I'd make an observation, too, about um, I think... Um, as an industry, the uh, content, entertainment, news, um, it, it's a, um, it is a rise to quality. It has to be because, it's, um, because people don't spend money if, they don't, if they're not interested in that um, uh, as an entertainment value. They don't stay reading a story if they're not engaged. Um, and I think that that actually um, tends to, to uh, create the – if the capacity is there – 
the interest only grows. New business models are created in order to access that content. New kinds of content are created by virtue of the capability, technology capabilities, whether it's an interactive content or a grouping of a new, being able to watch a, a, um, a, a, a program uh, around the world with friends, a real time, that's all now uh, coming to uh, fruition, they call it the second and third screens because of the new technology and new capabilities. So I, I do think content has a unique role to play in driving the interest um, and, um, and that itself because it is quality based or typically is quality based if you don't like the programming, that tends to enc encourage investment, encourage um, uh, entrepreneurship, encourage um, uh, new types of business models like Spotify and uh, Netflix and, and, um, and a global, uh, global uh, audience. So I, don't, I think it's, a, it's a truly a virtuous cycle if one creates more interest than the other and, and all three are necessary. So. I, w I would argue uh, with the language issue. I think lang language uh, might be a barrier uh, to uh, access information and if uh, information is not available in the language that the uh, person uh, masters so automatically that excludes him from um, the, uh, be, being uh, online and uh, uh, taking part in, in this um, uh, process. Um, that's why also local content most likely will be in local language and uh, uh, so, so that will drive, drive up the um, potentially uh, Internet users. Sec second aspect is uh, education. Uh, we, we see uh, that uh, if we take back uh, 10 years when uh, WSIS started, uh, the uh, main objectives which were put forward as a result of the uh, discussion was uh, connect schools. Today, uh, we see that majority of schools are connected, and also we, we, we've seen that there is an uh, exponential growth of use of Internet around the world. And one can, can think that, uh, let's say, new uh, young population is the one which really drives the, the growth of a uh, number of Internet users. Uh, we hear stories that uh, kids are uh, spending every penny they get uh, to get online in the, in the cyber cafes and so. Uh, and again, we need to, to pay attention uh, what kind of content they, they, they access and if there is not good quality content of different character, entertainment or education or cultural or, or, or whatever. So then, then of course, the, uh, the next is they, they get what they can get or access what they can get, the, the quality of the, of the local content also uh, is an issue. So I think that there is, uh, we cannot say that one drives other or, or vice versa. I think this is a sort of mutually reinforcing movement and uh, more, more we have users, uh, more content we need to have uh, and certainly more content we will have, more, more curiosity we will have from people and they will uh, start using if they are not using uh, until now. Yeah, um, local content that the way I see from the ecosystem is, you know, having this forum right now is very good. Uh, I have a chance to meet up with, uh, you know, Dorothy from Disney. Uh, in the past, uh, one of our portfolio is collaborating like with uh, Nickelodeon. is based in Singapore, a licensing business. So basically we license uh, the SpongeBob uh, characters, and then we develop a game. So those, this, this type of things is uh, very good, you know, because we know there's a market already for that. So collaborating with uh, a, a good brand, uh, established brands, and uh, also channels that is uh, established already. Uh, for example, like Kakao Talk, Line, uh, WeChat, you know, they have uh, actually. Uh, tap into the Indonesian market in a way that they create a local characters, you know, inside and then they sell uh, emoticons, basically. And it's a good a way for them to actually sell and monetize the platform. Uh, and I think Path is doing the same thing. They sell uh, emoticons, you know, it's, 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 I don't know, Indonesian loves that. <laughs> yeah. So I think... Uh, 
Yeah, we, we need to also uh, collaborate, I think, with a lot of uh, 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 established brands, uh, established like companies like Disney, Nickelodeon, and you know others. Uh, that's from my point of view. Thanks. Okay, that wraps up the time. So the last thing is please join me for uh, thanking the panel for an excellent discussion. <laughs>